Hello, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and our guest today is Danielle Belton, the editor-in-chief of The Root and creator of the very popular blog, Black Snob. Thanks so much, Danielle. Oh, thank you for having me. I, I love reading about you, because anybody who would name their blog The Black Snob, first of all, and, for, and second of all, that has two million readers. Yeah. Uh, how did you come to that? <laughs> Oh my goodness, so it's a long, very silly story. Yep. But basically when I was in college, this girl decided that I seemed really stuck up. Right. Even though I'm actually, I'm actually not, but I thought it was hilarious that she thought that. And I was like, oh, that'd be interesting. Right. And so I came up with the name The Black Snob, kind of as a joke. And now, now with two million people who follow oh, yeah. whatever you have to say there, not only there, but now that you're editor-in-chief yes. of, of The Root and just had a fabulous uh, gala yes. where you selected The Root 100. Oh, yeah, that was amazing. It was an amazing event. It was hosted by uh, Angela Rye, who actually is an honoree who's on the list this year, as well as A.J. Calloway from Extra. We had over 250 guests. At, it was at Guastafino's here in New York. It was beautiful. Right, right, right. And you gave Maxine Waters the Gladiator Award. Yeah, it was the first ever <laughs> award that, you know, that we'd given. Because technically, on the Route 100, the list, you have to be between 25 and 45. And she's slightly out of that She's age just a little range. bit out of that age range. Just a little bit. <laughs> like, she doesn't look a day over, you know, 20. But, you know, she's a little bit out of the age range, but she's been so phenomenal this year. This year has really been her year, and we just felt like we have to honor her in some capacity, so we came up with the Gladiator Award and honored her. Well, well, let's let's take a look at her, because uh, reclaiming my time was yes. a phrase that we're all using. Yeah, let's, let's just take a look. If, to go back, if you don't remember where this all started. I was going to answer that. Just please uh, go straight to and the answer. And Mr. Chairman, I thought when you read the rules, you acknowledged that I shouldn't be interrupted and that I would have Reclaiming the my time, what he failed to tell you was when you're on my time, I can reclaim it. I, he left that out, so I'm reclaiming my time. Please, will you respond to the question of why I did not get a response, me and my colleagues, to the May 23rd letter? Well, I was going to tell you my response. Just tell me. Okay. So, first of all, okay, let me just say that the Department of Treasury has cooperated extensively with the Senate Intel Committee, with the House Reclaiming Intel my Committee, time. Reclaiming with the my Senate time. Judiciary Reclaiming Committee. Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. Okay. Reclaiming Matter of my fact, time. Mr. Reclaiming Secretary, the, time. the time belongs to the gentlelady from California. Perhaps, Mr. Chairman, I don't understand the rules because Reclaiming I thought I was time. allowed to answer questions. Reclaiming my time, would you please explain the rules and do not take that away from my time? So there we have uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters certainly reclaiming her time. I see why you thought that she deserved to be in the Route 100 because she was really uh, putting... Uh, you know their feet to the fire in a lot of a lot of those uh, hearings, but but the basic uh, Route 100, uh, they're 25 to 45 years yes. old. And now I, I want to go through some of the, your honorees today. Jordan Peele, yes. who is the uh, creator of the film Get Out, mm -hmm. talk talk to us a little bit about him. Oh, Jordan Peele is one thing is is hilarious. You know, for years we got to know him on Key and Peele, this show on Comedy Central. Um, so he's a, just a funny, phenomenal comedian. And the fact that he was able to make this leap from comedy to an auteur to make this film uh, is really incredible. And have the film reach millions of people, break the box office, I think create catch... I think $250, $300 yeah, million. Yeah, so, yeah, and create a whole new phrase for us all to use, the sunken place. <laughs> now whenever we see somebody who's having like a rough time out there uh, racially... Right. You know, we wonder, are they in the sunken place, place because of that film? It's become part of the lexicon. Right, right. Well, I resisted watching it for so long, and then I finally saw it in my living room, you know, and, and enjoyed it thoroughly. So I understand why. He's number one on the list. Yes. And Solange Knowles now, her sister... Yes. ...has ruled the world for so many years, yes. and now Solange ranked higher than Beyonce uh, in, in this... Well, I ranking. really feel like in the case of these two sisters, Solange has been really influential on a lot of Beyonce's thoughts and feelings. Like, I feel like they're both having this great conversation together around race and activism and how to be both a celebrity and a singer, songwriter, and being a public figure who speaks out on the issues that matter to them. I mean, Solange got involved in the Bank Black movement. 
Uh, she put out the phenomenal album, A Seat at the Table. She just really is having an exceptional year. Okay, now Barry Jenkins, who, uh, who won the Oscar despite uh, the attempt to give it to someone else. <laughs> he but reclaimed his time. He reclaimed his Oscar. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Talk to us a little bit about him. Well, Barry <laughs> Jenkins is another just beautiful filmmaker. I mean, the, the, what he did with Moonlight was really revolutionary and incredible in the black cinema space. And he deserved every bit of honor. Like, it wasn't just a film that was just good by what people would consider to be like what a quote-unquote black film is. It was the good film, period. It was high quality art and it deserved every accolade that it received. So, and you mentioned Angela Rye. She's a favorite of ours around here. Yeah, you we know, love, love her. Love her podcast. And, you she, know. She, she doesn't hold anything back. She doesn't hold <laughs> anything back. That's she, exactly the, the way to put it, right? You know, it's like everybody heads down. Here comes Angela. <laughs> <laughs> and she, you know, she admits like, this is, she's always been this way. Right. This, is her, this is her personality. She's being her most authentic self. She's someone that speaks truth to power. Uh, if she thinks something is, you know, not right, she's going to articulate that. If she thinks something is dumb, she just will say that it's dumb. It's she's not going to come right. up with a bunch of fancy <laughs> words to talk around it. She cuts right to the bone. Right. I think that's why she's so popular. Yes. That we, it's, it's refreshing to hear somebody just get to the point. And I always forget that she's a lawyer. Yes. So she's got that, you know, background as well. You have Michelle Sindor. Love watching her analysis. Yeah. She writes for the New York Times, but is very popular on the, on the uh, cable shows. Oh, analysis. just a really solid reporter. You know, she really digs deep into her beat and really finds those stories that you can't find anywhere else. She's really exceptional at covering the White House. Right, right. And I love Charlene Carruthers, who's also been on the yes. show. And BY100 and... Yeah, BYP. You know, right, you know, just a fantastic organizer. Yeah, uh, she's doing great work in Chicago, you know. I mean, I can't give her enough credit for her on-the-ground community organizing. Right. And now Stacey Abrams, perhaps the first black woman governor. They're very exciting. In the country. And out of a place like Atlanta, out of Georgia. Yeah, right? out of Georgia. So <laughs> you know, if, if this can matter, like right now we were actually talking about the mayoral race in Atlanta where Keisha Lance Bottoms yes. looks like she might be able to pull out and looks like she's going to win. It's very, very narrow. There's some talk about a possible recount. So the fact that you could have yet another black woman take on a high profile leadership role with Stacey Abrams possibly being the governor of Georgia is really exciting. Like just Georgian politics in general is really exciting right now with the, the Atlanta mayor's race, but then seeing what's happening on a gubernatorial level is really thrilling. And I'm, you know, we're really rooting. Yeah, what's, what's, what's somewhat funny about the mayoral race is that they say it's the first time that a white person might be mayor <laughs> exactly. since 1970. Exactly. <laughs> it's so interesting. Roxanne Gay, who is just a phenomenal writer and I think writes from, you know, such a, a, a soft spot in her heart, mm -hmm. not only about feminism, but about her, about herself and, and so many of us. Yeah, she's really transformative in the way that she writes, um, really heartfelt and meaningful. And she has just done so much from her work uh, as a book author to, you know, she's gotten into comic books where she's been writing That's right. for Marvel. And so right. it's just, she's just someone else who's just always so outspoken. She holds nothing back. I follow her on Twitter. I, I love her. Right, right. Well, she's she's off, often, as a word that's been used to describe you, is snarky. Yeah. She's very snarky. Yeah, just a, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little. And Colin Kaepernick, of course. Oh, yeah. I can't. What I mean, he just won the Muhammad Ali Award from Sports Illustrated that Beyonce presented to him. Right. Um, and he is someone who has really stood by his principles in a way that's very admirable. He easily could have just thrown up his hands and been like, I submit, I, I just really want to play football. I take it all back. And he hasn't done that. He's stood by his beliefs. And no matter how people have tried to muddy the waters and try to make the protest about something that it's not, he's really steadfast and held true. So now you're editor in chief of The Root. Yes. Which is something that's amazing because you're a woman sitting right here. <laughs> right here before us, and that doesn't happen very often in any space, right? And, yeah. And, uh, tell us how that, how that happened. Oh, it was quite the journey, but yes. I've always had a relationship with The Roots since at least 2009. When I was writing The Black Snob, I used to freelance for them. They used to um, run my stories on the site quite a bit, and I always had a relationship with whoever was managing editor at the time because I wanted a job. 
Like I basically, <laughs> I when Joel Dreyfus was managing editor, oh, I think Joel, who's, yes, who's living the life in Paris. Yeah, he's living his best life. Is that right? But anyway. Yeah, in Paris, I would go to Joel and be like, Joel, give me a job. Like I'm, I'm what you need. I can totally, you know, make this work. I can make right. this happen. And he was just like, I don't, ha I don't have a job. If I could give you a job, I would, but I don't have a job. And uh, it was the same way with Cheryl Salomon, and it was the same way with uh, my predecessor, Lynn Pitts. Although with Lynn Pitts, when I called her up and asked her, hey, Lynn, give me a job. You need to hire me. I'm, I'm the one. She was the one who was like, you know what? I think I, I, think I have a job for That's you. great. Lynn is fantastic. <laughs> no, she used to be at NBC. You know, yeah. Just a fantastic journalist as, as, as well. So you finally got not only a job, but the job. <laughs> yes. So you know, your persistence paid off there. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm someone that does not give up very easy. I don't know if it's because I'm that confident and I have that belief in myself that's that solid or I'm just slightly delusional. It might be a little bit of both. <laughs> well, it works. It, it works. works. It does work. Now, now, the transition of The Root as well has been very interesting because it started out as a Washington Post. Yes. Uh, Don Graham property, Henry Louis Gates, Skip Gates, who was connected to it, and happy to know that he still writes for you. Yes. So, and then it went through uh, the, the, the turnabout that most online publications, we, we could say every publication now, where it's gobbled up in a sense. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about how that has transpired and what it means. You're doing very well now. Yes. Oh, we're doing phenomenal. Um, we were purchased by Univision in 2015. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been actually really wonderful for us. Mm -hmm. Univision has really stood by the route and has invested in the site. Um, our staff has grown considerably over the last two years. Uh, we have a great video team uh, that, we, uh, wor that we work with on a daily basis. We're now part of the Gizmodo Media Group. Um, last year, uh, Univision acquired uh, all the old formerly known uh, Gawker websites. Right, right. That um, sort of went out by, uh, on the heels of a lawsuit. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. So they purchased those sites, and the Gizmodo sites really have a proven track record of success uh, in the English language. Jezebel. Is yeah, Jezebel, sister. Deadspin, yeah. Kotaku, so many phenomenal sites. I, I was already a fan and a reader before they were purchased, and so the route was brought under the Gizmodo banner, and we became part of the Gizmodo family of sites. And since then, things, and we, we made some personal changes as well with our tone and how we uh, handle reporting and stories as well. We kind of like amped up our style and just got more political and more vocal and more unapologetic in how we approach things. And the site has really taken off since then. I mean, the traffic has grown as much as 100 to 200% month over month from last year. Yeah, you were telling me that you have like 11 or 12 million yes, readers, readers a, month. a month, which is pretty decent. Yeah, it's not bad, it's not bad. <laughs> Now, you're the biggest uh, in the African-American sphere. Yeah. Um, and wh what do you think about the, the health of the others? Let's assume that the root is going to blossom and probably gobble up some more. <laughs> but what, what do you see in the, in the terrain uh, for the other sites? Well, I feel like there's a lot of possibility and a lot of excitement if you're there to seize upon it. Um, this is a really interesting time in the space. We have a lot of, we have people... We have uh, organizations that are financially struggling and others that are flourishing, others that are merging and coming together, others that are kind of struggling to find their footing. So you have, like, say, you know, the Griot, which is part of Entertainment Studios, which, you know, just hired uh, Amy Dubois Barnett. And uh, right, I saw she's going to run. And this is the Byron Allen. Yes, this is and Byron Allen. I always Allen. remember him. I always thought of like him as an, an extra son of mine. No, oh. <laughs> watched him grow in television. And now I understand that he's a billionaire. Yes, of all of the. See how well my son is doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he now owns all of these properties. Yeah. So he's bought the Griot. Yes. And, and so he's investing in it and then building out their video apparatus, and that's very exciting. Uh, you have Essence that's going through a period of change right now where they're up for sale from Time Inc. Now, who's going to buy them, though? That's the, I mean, apparently they've separated them from the... Yes, they're not part of the sale to... Uh, to the Koch brothers yeah. and, and to uh, Meredith, but uh, who's, who 
it's always the case when Ed Lewis started Essence mm -hmm. and turned it into this this huge success, the question was who was going to buy it, and it was Time Warner. Mm -hmm. You know, there were not black investors who were standing at the ready to take it over. Yes. Um, so I'm hoping that this time around there are some black investors who can who can step in. Well, Essence is such a quality property, mm -hmm. I can't imagine that it won't find a home. Mm -hmm. I mean, between the fact that the, the brand is excellent, you know, has excellent name recognition in the community, it's very highly respected, it's coveted to be on Essence's cover, you know, people, sure. you know, are, I mean, it's a dream for a lot of people, to be, to, to be honest. And then you have the Essence Festival, which is a highly profitable, extremely successful festival that pretty much pays for the entire magazine. Right, so right. I, I really feel like they'll be able to eventually find a home. I, I'm very optimistic about their future. Right. Well, Vanessa has been here, the editor. Mm -hmm. You know, she's done the show. I'm waiting for my cover, by the way. You know, so, <laughs> so. aren't we all? <laughs> aren't we <laughs> all? You're like, wait a minute. You know, um, and they're doing a lot in South Africa as well, yes. globally. So that they're, they're really, really doing well. So now, tell me a little bit more about you. How did you? It's still. A miracle in a sense this I'm assuming one day you were a little black girl and growing up in a, in a family tell us about where all of that took place oh okay well I'm originally from st. Louis Missouri I'm the middle child of two wonderful beautiful black people my parents David and Dolores Belton um, and uh, what I do they oh, do what do they oh do? my father was an engineer he's retired now my mother uh -huh. was a school teacher uh-huh and uh, they were always very supportive of all my nerdish pursuits. Um, I, at one point as a child wanted to be an artist. I always wanted to be a writer. So that, that totally right, happened. Right. The art thing hmm, no. <laughs> didn't quite work out. But the writing thing went pretty good. Uh, and my, I, from a very early age, I took an interest in media. Like I started reading the newspaper daily around age like 11. Hmm. I used to watch 60 Minutes every Sunday night with my parents. Wow. And that's... then we would discuss what was on 60 Minutes afterwards. Right. And I felt like that was really formative. And one, how I felt about journalism, and two, how I felt about writing and TV and just so many different things about the world around me I learned from those conversations that I had with my parents. And what was nice about my parents is that I was a very odd child. Like, I basically have the same personality I have now and act the same way I have now, only was a little tiny kid for them. So I was like a little tiny adult. And You're the, the fact tiny that... version of your adult self. <laughs> exactly. <right>? exactly. <laughs> so the fact that my parents, who were actual adults, were willing to entertain these long, lengthy discussions about, you know, U.S.-Russian relations, you know, with their, like, 13-year-old daughter. Like, let's talk about, you know, what's going on with the Supreme Court. Yeah, you know, I would well, well, I I remember I watched the um, Clarence Thomas hearings, hearings with Anita Hill. Yes, right, and then right. I'd want to talk about them with my parents. Sure, sure. You know, I remember following the impeach, you know, the the impeachment around um, uh, President Bill Clinton, and reading the Star Report <laughs> in my local paper, <laughs> and then talking to my parents about it. You know, so the fact that they never saw me as like, oh, you know, you're a kid, you don't worry about this, don't talk about this. It was like, no, we want you to think about this. We want you to have critical thoughts and ideas. And they really encouraged me. Well, that's... So it never occurred to me that people wouldn't want to hear my opinion. That's basically what ended up happening. Right, right. Well, one of the things that I love, you started this, uh, the, the digital introduction of some blogs, and you have one, you're talking about yourself, the black snob. Yes. Why don't we go to, go to that? We'll, we'll learn a little bit more about Danielle. Okay. <laughs> what is a black snob? I don't know. I'm like, I totally just made that shit up. My name is Danielle Belton. My blog is The Black Snob. The idea behind The Black Snob was that I was a snob for like intellect or a snob for politics or literature or culture. And I wanted a name where people would click on it, even if they had no idea what the blog was about. The snob part originated when I was in college. Most people look at me like I'm this goofy nerd who's super approachable. To be actually referred to as someone who seems standoffish and aloof, like that sounded exotic and interesting to me. The black snob really had this air of like mystery or anger. Eventually I got jealous of myself because the blog started to take off and people were like, oh my God, the black snob wrote this. And I'm like, no, Danielle Belton wrote that I As a snob, I own what I do. The black snob, became a blog in 2007. I suffer from bipolar disorder. It is a mental illness. So I went through this really horrible, tragic, girl-interrupted 
period throughout most of my 20s. I decided to leave journalism to take some time off and figure my life out and get myself back together and get healthy. And I'll start a blog and let's see what happens. Out of like this really dark, sad, I'm like chronically unemployed and miserable period, birthed like this beautiful thing that completely revolutionized my, my entire life. The blog made me a fully functioning human being and it got me back on track. <laughs> uh, so health by a uh, prescription of writing a blog, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so um, pleased with the way you handled uh, your diagnosis and the sharing of that information. Most people uh, would tend to clamp down on that yes. and not talk about it, and that's just the you know the the problem. Tell us a little bit about that. How old were you? Do you believe when uh, when bipolar became a part of your life? Well, I'm pretty much convinced that like a lot, what like a lot of people who suffer from bipolar, it started manifesting in my early 20s. I was mm -hmm. probably around 23, 24 when I realized something was wrong, but I thought it was just clinical depression. Mm -hmm. And I went to into therapy for it, went to treatment for it, and for years. Um, I just kept cycling and having all these problems where I just couldn't get back to uh, like to an, an even level. And finally, after a hospitalization in 2005, I think, um, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And um, the diagnosis was both a relief and terrifying because I knew it was a, a very serious diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a relief that finally I knew what I had and that you know, maybe I could find some way to live with it. Um, at the time when I was diagnosed, I didn't like talking about it uh, because I was sure. still I was it's still going new, through it. Right, right. You know, I was still very depressed and still very much struggling. But I made a promise to myself that if I got to a point where I was back on track and felt good and was back out working and living my life, that I would be public and talk about it. Because the reality is, for a lot of people who have bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. they don't see other people with bipolar bipolar disorder like living a fully functional life. All they ever see are other sick people who are struggling like them at that time. Because most people who have this disease, if they manage to be high functioning, just never tell anybody. Because sure. they don't want to deal with the stigma. They don't want to deal with the discrimination. But I'm public with it because I want other people with bipolar to see me and to see that, look, there's a way out of this. Like, you can find a way to manage your illness. Mm -hmm. You can get better. You can live your full life. You can live your best life. And, and, and you have, have lots you, to look forward to. Have you had people reaching out to you? What do they, what do they say to you about, about your coming forward? You know, most people are really touched. Like, it, it does mean a lot for them to see someone publicly talking about it and talking about what the struggle is like and what it's like to actually live with the disease, to not look at as the disease is defining me or who I am, but the disease is just something that I live with. It's just part of my life that I manage. So now the, the blog helped you uh, to articulate your thoughts, your awareness of things, your, uh, all of that, which, so you're working through a lot of this as you, you know, as, as you write as well. What, um, what's uppermost on your mind now in terms of the issues that we need to deal with as editor-in-chief of The Root? Uh, what, what do we need to tackle? Oh, like in the news? Yeah. Oh my goodness. So I mean, the biggest thing that probably that we have been stuck on that we'll probably never be free of is the Trump administration um, and everything going on around it from the, the, the different racial fissures in our country that have like popped up because of how Trump talks about race, because of how he talks about people of color, because the, all the controversy over the wall and deportations and the judges and just this horrible mismanagement of our country that's going on right now, sure. uh, that's been quite in the forefront for us. Right, right. And you have been an, uh, a, a cultural critic uh, and yes. a political an analyst for some years now. Tell us a little bit about that. I know you worked with Farai Shadea, mm -hmm. Michelle Martin, all the, all the good ones, Bonnie mm -hmm. Arbay, yeah. uh, doing analysis for all of them. Talk, talk to us about that, being on call when they say, Danielle, come, tell, come explain the world to us. <laughs> oh, that was very exciting. I used to do a lot more television around 2011, 2012. I used to go on CNN with, um, with Frederica Whitfield on Sundays and talk about politics. Um, I did MSNBC uh, quite a bit a few times, and I did a lot of NPR. I still occasionally go on NPR to this day. You know, Michelle Martin is actually on All Things Considered now. 
on Weekend All Things Considered, and I go on that on occasion as well. And it's just exciting. It's a lot of fun. Um, again, like because as a child, no one ever told me that I, I shouldn't give my opinion. As an adult, I'm just like, oh, so you want to hear my thoughts on things? Of course, I'd love to tell you my <laughs> thoughts on things. You know, when you when you your people called me up and were like, would you like to give some thoughts? I'm like, okay, that sounds amazing. I'd love to give my thoughts. Yeah. So for 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 that little talkative little girl, you know, we're going right to the uh, Obama White House and. <laughs> And all of all of that. Talk to us a little bit about that. Oh, the, oh last year when I went to the White House Christmas party. Well, you know, I, I didn't get an invite this year, but I wasn't expecting one. Oh, well, <laughs> that makes all the difference. I was expecting one. <laughs> I was not. I was going to be shocked if the oh, group there was were up. a lot of people who were not invited. Yeah. April Ryan didn't get an no, invitation. No, she didn't. Uh, a lot of the LGBT uh, reporters did mm -hmm. not get invited to the White House this year. All yes. right, so last mm -hmm. year you went. Yeah, last year I went and it was oh, it was amazing. Um, you know, it's just a, such a the Obama presidency was such a historical presidency. No matter how you actually feel about President Obama, the symbolism of the first black president and the first black f first family, you know, it was just really um, amazing and thrilling to be a part of. And what do you think the legacy will be? Are you write, Are you writing a book now? Everybody should be. Uh, if anybody, I'm always should be, writing I a book. Say it would be you, right? <laughs> uh, the legacy of of the Obama administration of having a black. Well, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates, you know, wrote about uh, mm -hmm. our our eight years of having a black president. Yes. And we were talking a little bit about this before. He's taking some criticism because some people feel he's a little too pessimistic about about our future in the country? You know, I feel like he's just a realist. I mean, you think he, realism is the... Yes, I think he's dealing with, a, in, a, in a reality where you can have an incident like Charlottesville happen, where you have a bunch of white supremacists with tiki torches come together and cause a ruckus in the streets and a woman actually dies. Like, he's just dealing with the reality, the racial reality in America right now. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's going to come across as a little, as a little dark, because it is dark right now. So we, as we come to the close of the program, which I am so sorry, you definitely have to come back. We, we need this more Danielle Bell. <laughs> uh, we, we have our guests finish the statement, the power and the strength of black America lies in. How, do, how would you finish that? The power and the strength, strength of, black of black America, America lies in its people. It's people. It's inside of every, each and every one of us. Um, my mother once told me, that you know, black people, when we were brought to this country, you know, we were brought here to work and to entertain. We weren't brought here to have our own lives and ambitions and dreams and goals for ourselves. So every time we choose to live our lives to the fullest, to live our best lives, that's a revolutionary act. Every time we choose to make, to have families, to raise children, to fall in love, to pursue our careers, to stand up for one another, to love one another, to support one another, revolutionary act. Well, thank you so much, Danielle Belton, for being with us today. Editor-in-chief of The Root, uh, writing a book about all of us, future president of the United States. <laughs> thank you, and thanks to you all out there as well. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you.